Welcome to Listworthy's summary explanation of the survival mistakes made in the 2020 movie Don't Speak. It begins in the night with a mother and daughter having a conversation. The daughter steps out briefly to hang up some clothes on the laundry line when she hears weird animal sounds coming from the dark. So already she has committed the first survival mistake. She should not have been hanging up laundry in the night. That's a daytime job. And seriously, who hangs up laundry in the night? Laundry girl then commits survival mistake number two. Instead of running back into the relative safety of the house, she lingers and tries to see what's making the sounds. When the sounds start to get closer, she finally wises up and decides to get back in the house. But it's too late. The monster was standing behind her the whole time and it drags her off into the darkness. Inside the house, the mom hears her daughter screaming, so she goes outside to check things out. She hears weird sounds too, but she's smarter than her daughter, so she rushes back into the house and locks herself in, although I don't think that would do her much good because her door is 90% glass and I doubt it's shutterproof. So if someone or something really wants to get into the house, it's going to get into the house. The lights start blinking and the mom goes straight for her gun, but she's shaking so badly she drops her bullets while trying to load them. When she picks them up and finally gets them in the gun, she goes to investigate some weird noises coming from upstairs. But the monster seems to be a master of deception and making misleading noises. Instead of coming from the stairs, it sneaks up on the mother from behind. The scene then cuts to outside of the house and gunshots are heard. Elsewhere, a mother and daughter are speaking on the phone. I forgot the daughter's name, so I'm just going to call her Debbie, because she looks like a Debbie. Debbie's mom informs her that her father is in the hospital because he had a heart complication, so Debbie insists on traveling to her parents' house to be there for them. Debbie's mom insists it's not necessary, but Debbie is determined to come. When they end their phone call, Debbie's mom hears weird animal noises coming from outside. The next day, Debbie, her husband, son and daughter, and daughter's British boyfriend, pack up, hitch the trailer to the van, and head for the countryside. When they get to Debbie's mom's house, they find the door unlocked and the house empty, which is weird because Debbie's mom was expecting them. Thinking she maybe went to the neighbor's place, they go to the neighbor's place only to find that the house there too is unlocked and empty. Since the neighbor's place was a bust, they decide to go look for Debbie's mom in town, but when they try to start the car, it won't start. The dad thinks that the battery is dead because he might have accidentally left the car lights on, but his son assures him that he did not leave the lights on. And as if that wasn't enough, their cell phones can't find a signal, so they are now useless. Knowing that the town is close by, Debbie, her husband, and her son decide to go on foot while Debbie's daughter stays behind with her boyfriend, who tries to figure out what's wrong with the car. In town, there is not a soul in sight, but somehow our trio doesn't notice that, and they therefore commit the third survival mistake of the movie. Not being aware of their surroundings, and not questioning why a whole town seems to be empty. They get to a restaurant they think Debbie's mom may have visited, but they find it closed. Using the back door, they enter the restaurant, they find traces of blood on the floor, they see a bloody handprint on the glass of the door and on the edge of the counter. But still, after all these disturbing signs, they make the fourth survival mistake of not being sufficiently alarmed. Any normal person after seeing all these things would probably think that something is seriously wrong and want to leave and find the nearest police station. But not these guys. They linger in the restaurant, walking around with dumb looks on their faces. If I were them, I would have probably thought I accidentally walked into a crime scene and left immediately so as not to contaminate the site, but even that possibility doesn't enter our trio's mind. As Debbie's husband is looking around, a bloody man pops up from nowhere and scares the crap out of him. The man tells Debbie's hubby that something escaped from the nearby military barracks and urges him to run before he croaks over and dies. The trio now looks a little scared when they should be very scared. Deciding to head back, the trio slowly strolls out of town, therefore committing the fifth survival mistake in the movie. A bloody man just told them to run, yet here they are, walking as if they've got all the time in the world. After finding out that there is a monster on the loose, these parents should want to get back to their daughter as soon as possible, yet here they are, walking out of town at a pace that is slower than the one they arrived with. 
and again they seem not to notice that the town is empty. Any rational human being would conclude that a monster terrible enough to clear out an entire town is super dangerous and would get to safety as quickly as possible. Back at Debbie's mom's house, Debbie's daughter decides to stroll through the woods. She hears the monster behind her, but when she turns around, she can't see it, so she dismisses the sounds she heard. She gets to the empty stables without incident, but she accidentally knocks over some glass and the sound of it shattering draws the attention of the monster that seemed to have lost track of her momentarily. As she cleans up the glass, Debbie's daughter comes face to face with the monster. Okay, so I don't remember what Debbie's daughter's name is. The people in this movie are so forgettable. I'm tired of calling her Debbie's daughter, so I'll call her Jessie, I'll call her brother Jack, and the husband George. Okay, so after coming face to face with the monster, Jesse jumps into one of the stores to hide. The monster doesn't have eyes, so it can't see her. You'd think that such a creature would have a great sense of smell in order to zero in on its targets, but nope. It's implied that it hunts by sound, like the aliens in a quiet place, but from my observations, its hearing isn't that good either. Jesse walks around it as she tries to escape, and it can't hear her footsteps. Even the average human being would have heard those footsteps. But the script of this movie is so inconsistent because moments later, after Jesse walks around it, it suddenly knows where she is and chases her down. Luckily, Jesse manages to slam the door in his face and she finds herself in this weird room where her grandmother is wrapped in a cocoon. She commits the 60th survival mistake by not helping her grandmother out of the cocoon quickly. Danger is close by, yet she wastes time crying and being useless. Her options here were to either rescue her grandmother or abandon her or even look for a weapon to defend herself with. And there were lots of things that she could have used as a weapon, like the pile of what appeared to be planks and metal rods that was in the corner behind her. I'm going to count this as the seventh survival mistake of the movie. A person in danger should be highly motivated to fight for their lives. This monster isn't Godzilla, it's man-sized. She could have fought it off if she just bothered to pick up a weapon. I was under the impression that human beings, in the face of danger, would react either with the fight or flight instinct. But this girl does neither. If she would have picked one and stuck with it, her chances of survival would improve greatly. And for someone who just narrowly escaped the mysterious monster, she is super unalert to her surroundings. Because while she is still uselessly gawking at her grandmother, the monster somehow manages to get into the room without her noticing and it tackles her to the ground. It gets on top of her and starts slapping her like it would happen if girls got into a catfight, yet somehow she ends up wounded and very bloody. After the monster is done slapping Jessie, it pukes on her. It was at this point that I realized that there was no redeeming this movie. I wasn't expecting much to begin with, but this was just way too awful. This happens a lot with low-budget movies, but to be fair, there are some great low-budget movies out there. Just think of the first Saw movie and the Blair Witch Project. This movie, however, is not one that is destined to join the ranks of great low-budget movies. Anyway, back to the movie. Jessie's grandma screams for her to run, and with this motivation, she manages to very easily push the monster off her and runs. She gets to her boyfriend and tells him to run, but he doesn't run, he wants an explanation. And that's the eighth survival mistake. There is a time and a place to start an inquisition, but it's not when your bloody girlfriend, who has clearly been attacked by something, tells you to run. If I were him, I'd start running and ask questions later. They try to get inside the trailer, but Jesse's boyfriend gets attacked before he can follow her in. He ends up dead very quickly, and she locks herself in the trailer while the monster jumps up and down atop the trailer. It is not shown, but it can safely be assumed, judging from the sounds that Jesse hears inside the trailer. What really bothers me is that this monster managed to get into multiple homes and clear out a whole town, yet we are supposed to believe it can't manage to get into a measly trailer? I know it's a low-budget movie, but does the writing have to be this sucky? Night falls, the monster doesn't manage to get to Jesse, and the trio that went into town finally make it back to the house after taking their sweet time. When they see the monster, they sneak into the house without being heard, and they lock the door behind them. I would like to point out that for a movie titled Don't Speak, there is a whole lot of speaking going on. 
It's not like a quiet place where nobody dared to make a sound. The people in here are noisy as hell. The father explains that the monster uses sonic radar, that it makes noises that bounce off objects and is able to know what's around it like that. But I do not buy this. If that's how the creature works, these people, no matter how silent they are, would not be able to hide from it because it's not relying on the noises they make to locate them. The writer of this movie is trying to bullshit us. Also, how does George even know this for certain? He hasn't had any previous encounters with the thing. He should know next to nothing about it. George makes the very noble decision of leaving the house to go rescue his daughter from the trailer. But like his dumb daughter, he makes the dumb decision of not arming himself. He is inside the house. He should try to find a gun to shoot the thing, or if there is no gun, he could pop into the kitchen and get a knife for stabbing, or a rolling pin to whack the thing if it comes at him. George gets to his daughter and gets her out of the trailer, but for some reason, George decides to stop walking, but urges his daughter to go on. The dumb daughter doesn't want to move, she just wants to cry and stare at her daddy's face. The dad ends up shouting at her to go, attracting the attention of the monster that drags him off somewhere. Now that her father is most likely dead, Jessie runs into the house where Debbie and Jack lay her on a bed because she is in rough shape and the monster seems to have infected her with something. Elsewhere, after attacking George, the monster loses interest in him for no discernible reason and leaves him alive. Back at the house, after Jessie tells Debbie that her mother is still alive, she decides to launch a solo rescue mission and again, she does not attempt to arm herself. I became so sick of seeing this survival mistake again and again, I actually started rooting for the monster to get these people. They are too stupid to live. When Debbie gets to her mom, she wastes time crying instead of rescuing her from the cocoon. The monster shows up and she hides in a barrel full of water, which is actually a good idea, but she blows it when she runs out of air and resurfaces out of the barrel screaming unnecessarily. She could have just surfaced gently, taken another deep breath and sunk under the water again, but nope, she decides to scream. She is only saved because her son, who decided to follow her, screams as well and draws the attention away from her. While the monster chases after Jack, Debbie tries to get her mother out of the cocoon, but when she unwraps a part of it, spiders spill out of her mother's belly. Debbie's mother knows that this is the end for her, so she just tells her daughter to go, which she does. Jack's dad rescues Jack from the monster by pulling him into one of the stores and hides there with him. When the monster passes them by, George tells Jack to go, but just like his sister, he doesn't listen. He just wants to stare at his dad teary-eyed. George claps to draw the monster's attention while his son runs, but as he is being attacked, his son doesn't run. He curls into a ball and cries, not even attempting to pull the thing that is attacking his father off him. At this point, you probably notice that I have stopped counting the survival mistakes. But in my defense, I feel that I've covered everything and they just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Also, watching this movie was a mistake. Debbie witnesses the whole horrible ordeal with her husband. She has a shovel, but it's not for self-defense. She uses it to make a ruckus and draws the monster away from her son. But when it comes after her, she misses a good opportunity to bludgeon the thing to death. She drops her shovel and makes a run for it. The monster chases, she runs into the trailer and locks herself in, but she is far from safe because the monster rips open the door. Back in the stables, Jack still hasn't moved and is crying over his dying father. George laments how he wishes he would have lived long enough to see his son have kids before dying. In the house, Jessie finds that her wound is producing tiny eggs. She tries to dig the stuff out with a knife, but that doesn't work. In the end, she just ends up bleeding to death as she digs deeper into her flesh. In the morning, Jack emerges from the stables and finds his sister dead in the house with weird eggs falling out of her skin. After everything that's happened, he finally decides that it's a good time to get a gun. I would applaud him for this, except he should have gone for the gun sooner, before he lost his entire family. 
He walks to the trailer with the intention of killing the monster, but he seems weakened when he finds his mother still alive and wrapped in a cheap-looking, gauzy plastic cocoon. She screams for him to run when the monster starts to come at him. He lifts his gun to shoot it, but when he pulls the trigger, he finds that the gun doesn't have any bullets in it. He committed the final survival mistake of not making sure his gun was loaded. It would have taken him only a moment to check, but he didn't. Lucky for him, this mistake doesn't turn fatal because the cavalry arrives with guns that do have bullets and he is saved. However, Jack notices a scratch on his arm and from the looks of it, it's going to start making eggs too, like what happened to his sister. And that's how the movie ends. This movie annoyed me a lot. Gratuitous use of blood aside, for a movie titled Don't Speak, there was a lot and I do mean a lot of speaking going on. Even when people were dying, they were still speaking. I'm a big fan of A Quiet Place and thought that this movie would be a bit similar. I didn't expect this movie to be as good because of its very limited budget, but I at least expected a solid storyline. What we got instead was a story full of half-baked ideas. For example, right before she goes for her gun, the lights in Laundry Girl's house start flickering before turning off completely, and when Debbie's family's car stops working, it is heavily implied that the monster has something to do with it, like maybe it emits electromagnetic pulses that mess with electrical devices. But this idea is never further developed, explained, or explored, which is annoying. I give this movie a watchability rating of 3 out of 10. If you've already seen A Quiet Place and want to watch something similar, stay away from this movie and instead watch The Silence. It's not as great as A Quiet Place, but it's pretty good too. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button, leave a like and check out some of my other content.